Garnet sighed, waving a glittering red hoof. Coming, Onyx. Then she frowned and looked back at Vanity. We're sealing the redoubt. I'm sorry. Don't come here, Vanity. Go die somewhere else. Then she reached forward and the terminal went dark. This is outrageous. I must contact Auntie Celestia at once. She'll set this right. Blue Blood stammered as he started hitting keys with his magic. There was a green flash, and the Elder Prince was knocked away from the terminal. His eyes rounded up in astonishment. Vanity? What are you doing? We must... We must go do whatever you must. As must I. He began hitting keys on the terminal. A purple and blue icon of three gemstones appeared on the screen, and the terminal began to speak in a familiar voice. So terribly sorry, darlings, but I'm out of my office at the moment. Leave your message, and I promise to get back to you whenever I can. Blue Blood stared in shock as Vanity took a deep breath and closed his eyes. Rarity, it's Vanity. I'd hoped to speak with you before now, tell you what I wanted to say. It appears that our time is up, though. We've been betrayed. All of us. If you get this message... I've gone to Elysium. If you can meet me there, then I'll tell you what I should have done years ago. The screen flashed and went blue, and a message appeared at the bottom. Connection interrupted. With a sigh, Vanity rose to his hooves. Blue blood stared in shock. You. You and my rarity? You betrayed me? Vanity looked down at his older sibling. She was never yours, Blue Blood. She was never any ponies. She was far too precious for that. Then he looked at the door. Uh, now I suppose I must give some bad news, he said with a soft sigh. Without another look back, he walked out the door and towards the ballroom. The musicians played and the Aristoponies in their fancy expensive outfits chatted as this was simply another party and not the ending of the world. Vanity walked through the crowd and stepped upon the podium, upon which the quartet was playing. I recognized one of them, a gray pony with an elegant charcoal mane and a familiar instrument. Sadly, though, Vanity looked away from Octavia to the crowd below him. I was glad she got to play somewhere else before she returned to Flankfurt to die. Dozens of concerned faces stared up at him, Phillies and gentle colts, he began slowly. Five years ago, my brother and my nephew came to you all with a plan to establish a sanctuary for the elite of the country. Let the bureaucrats scamper away to Stable One. We would have a shelter of our own design and comfort. A place where the princesses and the aristocrats could retire and live until it was safe to return and rebuild Equestria. You gave generously. Some of you even had the privilege of seeing plans that we were creating. The majesty and grandeur befitting Celestia and Luna. He paused for a long moment, then said evenly, We were betrayed. Murmurs broke out, cries and shouts. Vanity simply stood there before them, looking out calmly as he surveyed the crowd. That calm demeanor seemed to spread throughout the assembled Aristoponies. They quickly composed themselves, far more quickly than I'd have imagined that they would. The redoubt is sealed, and those who have taken shelter in it have set this mob upon us for petty revenge. And while we may defend this place for a time, eventually this manor will fall. There are simply too many ways in. Therefore, I propose that you utilize Fancy Pence's airship to relocate to the Elysium Resort. It is both defensible and well-provisioned. Perhaps there you will be able to weather what is to come. The old buck stepped forward. I'd be more than happy to, old boy, but I noticed that you did not say we. Vanity pressed his lips together for a moment before sighing softly. I will remain here. Some bony must pay for this failure. I accept responsibility. Fancy Pants's monocle popped from his eye, and he chuckled. I say, but that is the most rubbish I've heard in ages. And I've listened to your brother, he said as he shook his head. 
Some pony is going to have to lead us and get us situated. And you seem to have a good horn on your head. Now, if whoever double-crossed us would like to step forward, well, I would happily leave them here to rot. But you, you've only ever wanted what's best for Equestria. Vanity's mouth worked. But there was a scream from the kitchens as the work staff raced into the ballroom. A group of shouting, rampaging ponies following on their heels. Find the stable, some bellowed. String up the nobles, roared others. A cluster charged the stage, wielding knives, improvised clubs, and occasional firearms. Vanity's magic reached out to seize the nearest, largest object he could find, Octavia's contrabass. The green light surrounded it as it slammed into a charging four like an immense club. The heavy instrument sent them all flailing away, and for an instant the invader's momentum was broken as the huge bass rammed horizontally into the group. One last mighty swing knocked over another outshoot away from the Aristoponies fleeing the room. From the screams and shouts and crashing glass and gunfire, though, Bedlam had erupted in every corner of the mansion. Some of the invaders turned their guns to the stage, but the contrabass rose, the bullets pinging off the wood. The white unicorn blinked and then looked at the stunned musician. Quite a sturdy instrument. The limited two dropped revolvers from the floor and began to carry out carefully and deliberated headshots. Faced with such opposition, most of the attackers retreated back to the kitchen. He paused a moment to float the contrabass back to Octavia, who hugged it tightly. Do you have anywhere safe to go? He asked as Fancy Pants and his filly walked to the door, the elderly unicorn lifting a dropped sledgehammer. Does any pony? She asked softly as she looked up at him with dark, sad eyes. Then the chaos flooded back into the ballroom and she was lost. Vanity turned away and raced to join Fancy Pants. The guards were still trying to fend off these surging masses, but the battle had turned as they were overwhelmed and their weapons seized. As the Aristoponies raced about, there was an immense crash and explosion that shook the immense manor. The screams built as the chaos spread even further. Fancy Pants and Vanity reached the upstairs hall, where a line of sandbags and furniture formed a barricade. Get over! Get over quickly! Vanity shouted as the panicked servants and Aristoponies scrambled for their lives. A few he lifted up and over with his magic as a wave of raging ponies raced up the stairs. Vanity and the few guards left held with bursts of fire from small machine guns for a minute. Then one of the guards ran. Then the other two. And still they came on. They tore at the barricade, their bullets shattering the elaborate mirrored walls and gouging holes into the fancy furniture as they chopped at the obstruction and tore at it with their hooves. Perhaps it was his control and poise, or simply that their fire was wild and undisciplined. But even as bullets skipped around him, not one found Vanity's hide as he kept his place. Then he looked over as the door to the nursery opened, and a terrified blue eye peeked out. Their gaze met for a second, and then he looked at the mob. You will not pass! He yelled as his magic reached out for every dropped firearm and wrapped it in a green glow. At once, every single weapon around him levitated into the air and pointed at the head of the stairs and the stunned faces of the mob who realized too late their folly. Then the guns roared in unison as a stream of bullets and gunfire tore the attackers to pieces. More were coming, though, and one after another the floating guns clicked on empty chambers. Bloodied, maddened, they came yet again. Vanity lifted a broken chair leg to meet them as they rushed the barricade. Then a glowing sword swept through the throat of one of the attackers as Blue Blood calmly trot forward to stand beside him. Touch my collection, will you? Trample your mud all over my house, you filthy peasants! Get my coat all dirty! Vanity smiled. You've been working on your swordplay, brother. And side by side they bashed and sliced the attackers till the assault crawled back away down the stairs. Vanity let the leg, a chair leg drop as he panted. Now, let us get the children to the airship. A sharp pain tore through his belly as a foot of steel buried itself into his gut. Vanity fell to his side, hooves hugging the wound as he stared up at the bloody sword floating beside his sibling. You should have kept your hooves off her, brother. 
rarity was supposed to be mine. She was supposed to marry me. He swung the blade and wiped the blood off as he trotted back down the hall. Slowly, Vanity pulled himself to his hooves. He magically removed the uniform and pressed it to his injury as he looked at the terrified eye peeking through the nursery door. Slowly, he smiled. Keep them safe, Harpka. Master Vanity, you are hurt. He took a deep breath, his guts on fire, and lifted his head high. This? Tis only a scratch. He said his blood trickled down his back legs. Now, keep the children silent and safe, Hopka. Not counting on you. Leave when you think it's safe to go. But, he raised his hoof to his lips. Any pain, any injury, any indignity is a small price to be paid in the defense of an innocent. Remember that, he said with a shaky smile. He nuzzled her gently between the eyes again. Now, close the door and don't worry about me. I think I'll retire to my room. I have a very sternly worded letter I need to write. He kept his smile, standing there patiently with that calm expression before she finally closed the door once more. His head drooped as he grimaced in pain and trotted to, to his room. He tossed the rumpled bloody uniform into the trash as he finally took a seat at the writing desk. The sounds of shooting were dying down now. Through the window, I thought I saw some kind of boat thing suspended from gas bags making its way east. It was already starting to sh snow as he drew out a piece of stationery and began to write carefully, the blood of his injury soaking slowly into the seat of the chair. I doubt you'll ever get this rarity, he said softly as he folded the letter and took out a small empty orb. I don't know if any pony will ever see this memory, but it is something that needs to be said. He drew a slow breath as he started to shake, his body growing chill. I'm going to die. Let me say that. Let me begin with that. Then let me say that had things been different, we could have been the greatest of lovers. If you were not a ministry mayor and I not a prince, then we could have had a better life. A life that you deserved. I know the mistakes you made, your many regrets, and I will take them all with me to the afterlife. He groaned at the throbbing buried in his gut. For any other who sees this, I pray that you will give a fool. I joined the project with the best of intentions to save lives. So much money, so much material, and now what does it all matter? I'm dying, my brother is mad, rarity. Sweet rarity. I did it to protect others against the inevitable. My nephew once said, It seemed to him that the only way to save Equestria was to destroy it. I thought he was only joking. In one of his moods, he so loved this country. Loved more than any other, I feared. Now all is undone. And damned me. I helped him. The redoubt. I don't know what will become of it now. Perhaps Garnet and the rest of the OIA cower in there still. He shuddered and closed his eyes. I am sorry. I wish I could tell you more, Miramare, my old locker, regret. I am sorry. He opened his eyes and looked at the glossy surface of the desk, at the tears that streaked his cheeks. Goodbye, Rarity. I pray we will meet again in better lives. The world swirled away, returning to darkness.